Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, Microgrids 201, Integrating Renewables and Battery Storage into Your Power Solutions, sponsored by MTU On-Site Energy. I'm your moderator, Jack Smith, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media. Here are some tips to help you get the most from today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or your audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the present presenter's picture. You can control the volume of the webcast by you adjusting the volume on your computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you are having technical problems with audio or the slide presentation, presentation click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to access a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. But if you do need a technician, type a message in the Ask a Question box, and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Individual technical questions will be answered in the Answered Question box. Type questions for our speakers in the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen. The live Q&A se session will begin after the pre presentation concludes. Today's webcast is being recorded. You will receive an email within a week with the link to the on-demand event. To download a certificate of completion and a PDF copy of this presentation, use the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen. Those documents will also be available with the on-demand version of this webcast. Now we will hear from the sponsor of today's webcast, MTU On-Site Energy. At the conclusion of the video, you may experience a few seconds of silence to compensate for varied internet speeds. Please stay tuned after the video for today's presentation. I'm happy to introduce today's distinguished presenters, Tom Drake and Brian Ponstein. 
Tom Drake is Regional Sales Manager for Gas Powered Systems at MTU Onsite Energy, where he handles continuous gas sales in North America. He earned a bachelor's degree in history and secondary education from Grove City College in Grove City, Pennsylvania, and has 12 years of experience in the power generation industry. Brian Ponstein is a regional sales engineer at MTU Onsite Energy, who is responsible for sales engineering for half of the United States and all of Canada. He has a bachelor's degree in heavy equipment service engineering and an MBA from Ferris State University. Brian brings more than 11 years of experience to the company. Thank you for joining us today, gentlemen, and the floor is all yours. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Brian. How's it going? It's going great, Tom. Great speaking with you again today. Great speaking with you. Let's go over our agenda real quick for everybody. Um, today, we're really going to um, address battery energy storage systems in microgrids. So we're going to start with a, a definition. Then we're going to talk about how storage and microgrids work together, uh, the importance of storage in grid design, uh, the different types of storage that are available, uh, the, different the different trends in grid storage, applications and financial models, uh, what we see as the future of energy storage, and then some of the reference material that we used uh, to put this presentation together today. All right. So, so Tom, can you uh, kind of help me out in understanding a few different things to cover the basics? And what are we talking about when you talk about grid storage or energy storage? Uh, is this really just a couple of AA batteries that we're putting together? No, it's much more complicated than uh, just a couple of batteries. Uh, it's, you know, it's, think about it like your cell phone or your, uh, or uh, even if you drive an electric vehicle, but on a much, on a much larger scale. So what we really traditionally, you know, what we look at energy creation, you know, in traditional uh, power generation sources like coal or natural gas or diesel, you're really transforming energy from one form to another. Um, and now with grid storage, we're looking at really the, the storage of that energy and, and, and applying it when it is most efficient and when it is needed the most. Uh, so what we're really going to look at today are the two main kind of places where these battery energy storage systems can work, um, in grid support or in front of the meter, and then at the customer level or behind the meter. What do you mean by behind the meter or grid support? Oh, when we talk about behind the meter, we're talking about maybe, a, you know, as far down the utility stream as your house, where maybe you've got some solar panels installed at your home, and you want to make sure that when you get up at 4 a.m. to start working for MTU, that the batteries, that, the, that solar energy that you created yesterday on your roof is available for you to make your espresso. You know that we can we can really use these this equipment as, as far down the uh, far down the utility chain as at your as at your home or at a manufacturing or a commercial or industrial facility. Well, that I I appreciate that you think about my espresso because that's highly important as you know. <laughs> uh, but let's let's kind of kind of take this a little more basic. Uh, I was last last time we I talked about this. I was talking with Christian. He explained to me what microgrids are and basically a microgrid what we have is we have avail we have multiple power generation assets these are dispatchable via a controller of some sort uh, we're going to local we have local demand centers whether we're using that like at my own house to make my espresso or whether that's for everybody in my community to make their espresso uh, it goes both ways but then i also have to have <laughs> that system be islanded uh am i remembering all this right or am i missing anything you're, you're absolutely correct. So really, you know, every every microgrid, every every customer really you start with a load, whether it's at your home where you're plugging in your phone to charge, or you're or you're plugging in or starting up a manufacturing process. You, you start with that load, and then you start with maybe some distributed generation resources. You know, wind, solar. You know, some of the things that MTU specializes in in cogeneration and natural gas power generation. You know, those are the, some of the, you know, as we call distributed generation resources, those are some of the things that we see 
that can be dispatchable to help support your load. And then now we also have the, the interplay of energy storage systems. You know, energy storage can be multiple, uh, you know, multiple different kinds of technologies. And we'll talk about some of those as we go. But that energy storage technology allows you to store up that variable creation of electricity from those distributed energy resources and dispatch it to the load when, it, when it's needed most. And then the most important part, and we'll cover this in the, the microgrid 3.1 uh, presentation, is the control system, is how do you optimize all of these assets you know, to support the load, to use intelligently your distributed generation uh, resources, and then finally, how all those resources and the load are going to play with the grid. Okay, so you that know, makes as, a lot as you of talk sense. About with, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say that that makes a lot of sense, and it starts to put all the pieces together. But how does what, I guess why are we using batteries or renewables, and why is that so vital to the system, and how does that fit into the market? You might say. Well, there's a lot of different areas where battery energy storage systems can help improve. You know, all the way up the line to the grid where where power is is generated, uh, right down to the customer, like we were talking about earlier. You know, it could be as important to a company as a corporate image to, to, be, to be a little bit more green in how they use the, re, the renewable energy that they self-generate. Um, it could be, you know, an island mode uh, application where there's no utility at a, distant, at a distant location, whether it's a military base or a, uh, or a remote village where you have to really optimize maybe the diesel fuel that you bring in once or twice a year. Um, so really you can go to as local or as widespread utility-wise on where you can insert these, these batteries as it, as it makes sense. Okay, okay. And then how do, we, how do we further optimize these batteries into a system and make that more efficient? Well, the, so as you, look as, a, as, if you, as you look at the grid as a whole, Brian, the, we've really seen a, a great increase over the last couple of years in the installation of renewable energy into the grid here in North America. You know, at this point in time, 60, 62% of all new power plant construction is in renewable energy. And there's been a 70% increase in the renewable energy capacity installed in North America since 2008 for like a total of 244 gigawatts. Of renewable capacity and as you can see on the slides on the, on the charts down at the bottom the lion's share of that new installation is in wind and solar wow that's that's pretty pretty interesting and i, I haven't ever seen that before is does this really explain some of what we talked about in the previous webinar about how some power plants are being decommissioned and this is maybe a solution to some of that or are we looking at two different things well absolutely so you know, nothing is static. You know, the only constant in life is, is change. So as they're adding more of these renewable energy resources, you're seeing the retirement of the traditional kind of what we call base load energy creation assets um, across North America. And as you look at this slide and this chart, you can see the, the increase in wind and solar on the top of the line, and you can see the really the consistent decrease in decommissioning of those traditional uh, coal and, uh, and natural gas power plants. Okay. And I, I lived in Europe and I heard rumor that there's some issues with, I'll say, some of these renewable sources and it never really made sense. Can you help me connect the dots as to what are some of these things that we have to consider when we start going into renewable sources rather than the traditional, I'll say, nuclear facilities or natural gas power plants? Absolutely. So when you think of, you know, nuclear, coal, natural gas, you think of a, of a base load power, something that's always on. And that's really demonstrated by this slide. You know, nuclear power with almost 93% of a capacity factor, meaning the time that that energy, can plant, energy plant can produce at maximum power. And you see where both coal and natural gas are above 50%. But the issues as we start to see the increase in renewable generation uh, installed in North America is really the, the low capacity factors of wind and solar, both below 
And those low capacity factors really require you know, an additional sometimes generation source that is fast responding, like reciprocating engines or battery energy storage systems to augment that low capacity factor. So it sounds like there's a key item here, and that's really that with a wind or a solar system, I may need power, but I might not be able to produce power. Can you help me understand that a little bit more? Absolutely. So, you know, anytime as an engineer, I'm sure you know this, Brian, you design for the optimum. Sometimes you, 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 you know the optimum, but you probably design for the worst case scenario. So if you look at this mm -hmm. slide, it's a really great example of that. You know, the ideal world, the sun is shining, um, you, get, you get 120 kW from this, you know, solar installation that's displayed on this slide on an ideal day. But we know, you know, living in the Midwest, as I do, you know, I think we've had rain since, uh, since about February uh, to June here in the, in the Midwest. So your actual production of, of power is going to be separate from the ideal. And in this case, you're almost a 50% capacity factor from the design. So you really have to be aware that you may have 120 kW solar array on your roof, but there's going to be days when you may get lucky to be get 60 kW. Wow. Yeah, and especially with how much rain we've got lately, it's it's been kind of insane. But how do we <laughs> how do we look at this and make it a little more uh, a real world situation? How does this like? Obviously, this would be a smaller scale, but we're talking about bigger stuff. What? How does this look like for that? So on the, on, the, on the grid as a whole, you know, California is always a great place to start, for example. They usually are, are leading the way in a lot of these technologies and, and the implementation of them. So, you know, you've heard uh, it's, an industry, it's an industry trend. It's called the duck curve. So it's really how does the capacity mismatch uh, to the demand? You know, so in this particular slide, you can see that during the middle of the day, the distributed solar and the utility scale solar are really producing or almost overproducing what the load at that particular portion of the grid requires. But you have two problems there. One is that there's a time in the day when that, wind, when that solar production is going to begin to reduce, but that's when people are starting to arrive home, starting to turn on. Maybe they're looking for that afternoon cappuccino. And mm -hmm. so that, that creation of that free power is starting to go away. So you have an increase in price and an increase in demand. So, you know, a battery energy storage system can maybe store up that overproduction of solar and dispatch it uh, quickly when demand increases and price increases. So it really helps you, whether it's on a grid scale or at the, at the very, at the customer level, allows you to manage the creation and use of that renewable energy. So you, you mentioned a few different times. I noticed the key word you mentioned, uh, cost or price. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. How does, how does this really fit in, or how does that look in optimization of the whole system? So in this particular application, we're looking at more of a, you know, it's a utility scale problem. Once again, you're looking at grid congestion, lots of demand located in a in a highly dense area so you're looking at how and then maybe that area doesn't have the capacity to serve all of those customers maybe it's a it's a factor of the line size not being correctly or the transformer uh, not or the substation not being able to be upgraded to meet that that capacity so that capacity maybe is not the entire day as you can see in this graph once again it's a variable. There's times of day when the capacity is going to be a little bit low, and then there's times of day when the, the capacity requirements on that, on that section of grid is going to be a little bit higher. So in this particular case, the utility recommended some energy efficiency uh, savings and, and measures taken, and then they also looked at installing a battery energy storage system to serve those customers as close to the uh, demand as possible to reduce the load on that substation, and it allowed that utility to defer those uh, upgrades on the substation so they could afford them further down the line. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. Let's, let's not talk too much about financials. You're going to get me lost, but I think after we understand some other things, we can tie back into this financial stuff. 
Can we kind of, we, we talked a lot about storage, energy storage, and you keep on using the word energy storage. I keep on using batteries. Obviously, there's more than just batteries. What, what, is, what technologies are available out there and what is being used? So historically in North America, you know, the, the lion's share of energy storage systems are pumped hydro. You know, a very simple type of system, you know, very high capacity, lots of potential megawatts available. It's really moving water uh, when power is cheapest. You move it uphill, and then you allow it to flow, you know, uphill when power is cheap, and you allow it to flow downhill across some sorts of energy uh, transformation device to create power when it's expensive. So there, it's a very, you know, it's very prevalent. You see a lot of them. But, you know, now with, the, with more of the distributed, but they're hard to cite. You know, they're, you can't put a pumped hydro storage uh, solution in your backyard, Brian. Those are much more utility scale projects. So now with more of the distributed generation push here in North America, we're seeing other technologies um, start to get implemented. And really the, the one that has been dominated recently is lithium ion battery technology. So that's where you get your battery uh, verbiage for Brian. Okay, and then with batteries, it's my understanding that there's two different topics, a power capacity and an energy capacity. What are we looking at here? So, you know, you can, and you can see on both of these that lithium ion is really the dominant technology for both of these as well. And power capacity equals the megawatts that are available. And then the energy capacity is going to be how long or how long we can discharge that, uh, that power capacity. And we'll really get into some of the description of that um, here in a couple slides. But as you can see, okay. you know, both, of these, you know, both of these applications are dominated by lithium ion. But why, why is that, Tom? I mean, that's, that seems pretty interesting. What is it about these lithium ion batteries make it so, I mean, we're basically looking at 95% of the market is eaten up by lithium ions. Is there a reason for that? Absolutely. So it's a very high efficiency and fast responding technology. You know, the mineral itself is uh, really readily available. Um, and one thing that's becoming important and is really important is it's highly reliable and it has a very high power density. You know, this, the, this demonstration of the MTU energy pack down here below, really the whole system fits into a 40 foot ISO container. And they're great for short duration or long duration applications, which as we go along in the rest of the presentation, you'll see really those are the dominant uh, applications for this technology. And, and when we look at these batteries, I've, I've done a little bit of research on this and I got confused between this thing called C-rate, um, state of charge. Can you help me understand what exactly we're talking about with these things and maybe give me that decoder ring a little bit? Absolutely. Well, I'll make it easy enough for an engineer even to understand. <laughs> awesome. So the C rating is really how quickly and how or quickly how slowly you can charge and recharge the battery energy storage system. So you have different ratings from a 10C, which charges really quickly, to a 0.1C, which is going to charge and recharge very slowly. Um, and that's really will the C rating will really dictate the application of the battery for a different for each different individual project and customer. So not all batteries are created equal. Absolutely. And the state of charge and depth of charge like you had asked about earlier, you know, it's really how much um, energy at any given point in the cycle is available uh, for use, you know, whether it's how much is energy is available to discharge the customer or how much is needed to recharge it back up to 100 percent yeah and it's it's kind of interesting that this technology seems so great but there obviously have to be some challenges or something that is kind of impeding this from just really fully taking off can you talk about some of those challenges that exist in our market today or in this market uh, absolutely for what we're dealing with So some of the challenges that we're starting to see are you know, the, the rising electricity demand. So like when we talked about that, um, the deferral of the substation upgrade, you know, 
you have more and more people living closer together, requiring more electrically connected devices, whether it's an electric vehicle, your phones, your, I, your iPads, your, your tablets. Um, then you have the rise in electricity generation from renewables. And we've already talked about that a little bit earlier. You know, the, the great variability of that generate, of the, the ability to generate with those types of resources, and then the decarbonization. And to, to me, that really means efficiency. You know, how do we efficiently use those rene renewable resources to reduce your carbon footprint? And those a lot of times are being driven by, you know, like we talked about e-mobility, you know, electric vehicles, you know, decentral decentralization and microgrids. You know, people are looking to have those energy creation assets located closer to the end user as much as possible. And then you have the hybrid, um, hybrid energy resources, really the true microgrids. And, and really the goal is how do we save our customers money uh, by optimizing the, the resources that they have available. And really that's MTU's uh, focus as we go forward is how do we optimize the traditional uh, energy resources like coal and natural gas and diesel and with the, the available natural um, renewable energy resources. Is, so, so you make it almost sound like this isn't anything new. So are, is this something already in place in the market today? And what types of applications are we talking about that already use this? You know, absolutely. So, you know, when you talk about battery energy storage, as you can see by some of the graphs here online, that, you know, you really start to see an uptick all the way back in 2011 with battery energy storage systems. So like we talked about earlier, the definition, you know, power capacity is the megawatts and the energy capacity is the megawatt hours. And we really see these applications located in really two parts of the country. You know, the power capacity or the megawatt applications for short time use are located in PJM, kind of the middle part of the country. And then the long use application, the megawatt hours, you know, the energy capacity, really we're seeing those applied uh, in California. And those, you know, different events uh, that, has, that have affected the grid have really led to those different implementations in the different parts of the country. So you can see in the California ISO, we have 130 megawatts installed, but the megawatt hours is almost 390. And so that just gives you an example of where and what types of applications those batteries are, are being applied here in, in the United States. This is great, but these are installed applications. If I look at it from me engineering stuff in the future and whatnot, is there really any any market trend that shows things moving forward that this is going to continue? Yes, we know. Yep, we understand that definitely engineers can't work on things that are already installed. So we always have to look and help you find projects to work on, Brian. So this really Thank is you. a really good represent. <laughs> we want to keep you busy. You know, we, we board engineers. You know, we, this is no fun. So in this slide, you can really see some of the installed and some of the projects that are being planned throughout the different ISO regions. You can see, once again, that California is definitely leading the way. You know, the darker the blue, the more potential and more applications that are being uh, processed. The Northeast and Texas, uh, Florida, uh, the industrial Midwest, those are all areas that are seeing increased activity uh, for battery energy storage applications. So now, Brian, that you've seen kind of these, the different ways that we potentially can apply uh, battery applications, do you see where some of these things can be used um, in the day-to-day -day business that you, that you work with? Yeah, this, this actually helps me put things together a lot better, and I do appreciate it. The first one is really energy shifting, or really just managing or shifting energy consumption uh, to further optimize my entire system. More technology gives me another piece in my toolbox to, to make things more efficient. The other one is power quality. Um, this one here, I can really see these uh, storage systems giving me that security from a power quality perspective that a lot of my clientele need, uh, mostly in the mission critical market, but I think many others as well. Uh, another one would be with the integration of renewables that they can, that battery storage can 
really take these renewable sources and bring them to the next level. Again, a nice pair of technologies to cause one, one deficiency in one area to really make it a, a really, really good system. And then the other is really backup power, almost like a, a, a reciprocating engine that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Those, are, those applications, I bet, are near and dear to your heart. They are. Uh, <laughs> or, if we look, or if we look at energy shifting, just to talk about what I mean by this a little bit, is we could use a, a storage device to really absorb power when there's excess power available or cheap power, however it may be. And then when either power is expensive or when I don't have enough capacity, I can release that power from the stored device and keep my demand lower. Uh, is that a safe assumption for from what you've been talking about? Absolutely. So, you know, one of the things we even described right here is is peak shaving. So where we're always, you know, if, if you're an industrial or commercial end user and you want to manage that peak, you know, a battery energy storage device really is a great way to make sure that you stay within your, uh, your utility tariff. And if I look at power quality, uh, really a, a battery in a large scale, like you showed with that 40 foot container, um, it's really just a, I call it a, a grown up version of the UPS that uh, a lot of mission critical facilities are using on a smaller scale. Now we just upscale it to power up the whole facility rather than an isolated location, like an IT load of some sort. Uh, and this would basically just help me out in making nice clean power for my entire facility. Um, no, absolutely. I, as you can see, oh, as you, as you can see here, it's really about, you know, keeping the frequency and voltage as close to possible. And like you were talking about at those mission critical facilities, that's really important. And then when, if I look at pairing this with renewable, I'm, I'm assuming I'm somehow using the, the renewable source to where I have that uh, veritable creation and allowing the battery to give me a smooth ride through that somehow allows me to match my demand with what I can actually create. Am I missing something? That's really kind of what I put together from what you've said, but I might be missing something. No, you're absolutely correct. You know, you, you're charging the battery when the renewable energy is available and then discharging it either when it's no longer available or when the power is more expensive and you need to reduce your purchases from the grid. So, you know, battery energy storage system, we really see, you know, one of the key it's one of the key factors in really successfully using, you know, on-site renewables at a, at any facility. Mm -hmm. And then like we talked about uh, previously, the backup power, this really, uh, really uh, brings up a whole new uh, application to where not only am I stuck with using reciprocating engines uh, for longer periods of outages, I can actually use a battery system that gives me instantaneous uh, reaction times where that's measured in milliseconds and I can have power for uh, long periods of time. It's going to totally depend on how much capacity I have on site like you talked about earlier uh, between the two different regions where you see both of them happening. Uh, and this really could offset some of the reciprocating applications uh, for a battery system and gives me another thing in my toolbox, correct? Absolutely. So this this is a perfect application for an engineer, Brian, where you can you can figure out what is the correct mix of traditional standby assets and battery energy storage systems really to optimize um, a mission critical site. Not that I'm giving you and any I, homework. I, oh, I, I think there was something in there. Um, sounds like there's some projects coming up. I'm going to look forward to it though. But when we, when we look at this, I really think that there's a few different applications that these can fit into and what are the main applications that we're really looking at for these types of systems. So really, you know, the next thing we're looking at is where these can be applied on the grid. So you've got, you know, like we talked about, the further away from the customer, you know, the, the less maybe value stacks that we can have, but you can go all the way up to the, you know, the regional transmission service or the utility services or as close to the customer like we had talked about. There's places that where we can put batteries and they can add value at the transmission, the distribution, and what we call behind the meter uh, locations. But the closer we can get it to the customer, the closer we can get it to your cappuccino machine, Brian, the more value uh, that we can add. 
you're speaking my language. I just keep on relating it back to that espresso and I'll be fine. But again, I, I am a little bit more of a visual learner. Can you kind of show me where these batteries would be put? I know you read a lot of textbooks getting your history degree. I hated history, so I know you can help me out in this a little bit. I'm, I'm very much a, a visual learner as well. Uh, so what we look at is, you know, where the battery can be located to add value and the types of value that it can add. You know, if you look at the industrial user, it's like we talked about backup, as simple as backup power. Um, the other ones is, you know, the optimization of renewable energy. And then we talked about on one of the earlier slides is maybe it's a, it's in, it's a transmission or distribution upgrade deferral that a utility might put in a, a set of batteries to help manage that, that future cost. And then, you know, all the way up to the grid size, solar and wind farms, where you can put multi megawatts of batteries in parallel to really help store up and match up to the grid. Okay, we've, we've seen a lot of areas where they can be used, but how are they actually being used today? So really, there's three areas that we see the lion's share of applications being used at. So we have demand charge reduction, which we talked about in one of those four silos that we talked about earlier, backup power, and then renewable self-consumption. So those are the three main stacks that we see the batteries get used in. But one of the problem is that usually a battery system is dedicated to a single application and less than 50% of that battery's capacity is used on that primary application. Wow. So we have to really so, focus on stacking those values to create a good return on investment for customers. So it sounds like we, we have to dive into the financial model again that I really didn't want to, but it sounds like we have to. Uh, can, you can you kind of talk about this in a little more detail? So this is another really good application. It's commercial demand management. So what we're looking at again is a customer has a tariff, and in this case, it's about 500 kW. And anytime they go above that tariff, the utility is going to set their, their price for the next 12 months. So the idea is always to stay at or below that tariff. And in this case, you know, like any, like any normal commercial building, you're going to have differences in load throughout the day. So in this particular case, you can charge the battery in the morning, discharge it at the peak, maybe right before lunchtime, and then charge again after lunch, and then discharge again in the afternoon, always making sure that you're at or below that, uh, that tariff. And then as you can see over here to the right, on the, the column on the right, it kind of gives you the revenue and the time that each of those value stacks are available to the battery in this particular application. Yeah, and this makes a lot of sense. It's basically a peak shading type application that we use uh, reciprocating units for. But how does this differ when I start looking at it uh, more from a distribution system? I'm under, I, I would assume that it has to be a little bit different as to how the economics play out. Absolutely. And this is the slide and graph that we've kind of used a couple times during today's presentation because this is a really good example of how batteries are applied on the, on the grid scale. You know, it's a similar application to the commercial but this time it's much, you know, you're really, you're at the maximum capabilities of a, of a grid service. In this case, it's a substation where your maximum, you can't, you're, you're going to be forced to upgrade those devices unless you can find a way to reduce the, the demand during those peak, uh, peak times of the day. And in this case, it's a combination of energy efficiency um, projects and grid storage device that once again is going to charge uh, during power, the cheaper power of the day and the lower demand and then discharge closer to the customer when the power is at or above the substation capacity. These ones are a little bit harder to stack the value because they're further away from the end user and it makes it a little bit harder uh, to evaluate the return on investment, but it's really dependent upon how much, um, how, how much that grid upgrade is going to cost uh, down the line. But that sounds like it's something that we're going to have to dive into once we get into the, the calculation models for these systems in the next webinar and things of that sort. But what are some of the things that MTU is doing to ensure that 
what we produce, what we sell, and things of that sort actually meet or do what we claim that they're doing? Well, the first thing that MTU is doing is we are putting together a validation center at our world headquarters in Friedrichshafen, Germany, where we're going to have our battery energy storage system paired with really all the different types of traditional and non-traditional uh, utility resources, whether it's going to be solar panels, uh, the, the grid, uh, some of our cogeneration systems that are currently operating at the facility, and some of our diesel standby. Really, the goal of that site is going to be to validate and test, you know, customer-specific applications to, to really demonstrate the best solution, both in the form of the battery and the intelligent controls to really optimize uh, the energy usage and, and really create a microgrid, as we're talking about, for any customer. Okay, and it sounds like you have a lot of experience with this, and in the previous webinar, we had a lot of people asking about, dude, do you have any applications where you've already installed this, things that we can learn from it? And it's my understanding that we actually have a few of these that we can talk about and draw some insights. What, what kind of projects do we have that are out there? So we're seeing a lot of different you know, applications spring up around, the, around North America, you know, and a lot of them are kind of being led by industrial users that have constraints on the availability of three-phase power. In this particular application, it's a greenhouse project that we're working on that you know, they have plenty of natural gas availability, but very limited availability of three-phase power. So you know, we're putting together an energy system for them to help manage both their electric loads and their chilled water loads. What, what kind of technical challenges did you have to overcome? You, you talked about some of the issues of power that they had on site, but to overcome this, what kind of things did you have to look at to, to engineer into the system? Well, the, the, the first and the most important technical challenge is definitely the lack of three-phase power. Natural gas engines traditionally don't like uh, transient loads uh, being removed and added without some control. So the battery in this case really is going to offer some grid forming and load leveling services to make sure that we can transition the loads from generator one to generator three and back and forth as smoothly as possible to keep the engines running as efficiently as possible. You know, some of the other challenges about? specific, oh, and some of the other specific challenges were very high ambient temperatures and then really an, a, a, you know, uptime guarantees because the customer is really looking for us to generate the grid for them as the grid is not available. Okay. And then what, what kind of solutions did we actually use to provide for this system? So, I mean, what, what's actually going to be there? In this particular case, we're really looking at a mix of MTU natural gas uh, reciprocating generators, uh, one 1100 kW and two 1500 kW units, uh, full heat recovery for, uh, for chilled water, and then power uh, to supply the three-phase power for the, for the system. Okay. That, that sounds like a really good system. I'm excited to see how this pans out in the future, how the, how the client likes this solution. But as, as you know, Tom, I'm kind of a mission critical kind of guy. Do you have another application to where we can relate this maybe more towards the hospital or something of that sort? Absolutely. Mission critical, I know, is, is near and dear to your heart. So we look at off-grid hospitals as well. So we're looking at a, a healthcare facility in the Caribbean, really in this particular island, only about 30% of the people have regular access to electricity. And this hospital handles about almost 100,000 patients annually. So this is the very the description of mission critical as you talk about it. Yeah, I, I really wish I had your job to go to the Caribbean more often. This looks like <laughs> fun. But what was, what was installed or what, what do we got going on at this site? You know, so they had, you know, like most hospitals, you know, but this one a little bit different than the standard, you know, they had various sizes of diesel generators, but these were really in prime power applications. Um, and they had an existing about 650 kW installed solar array. But as you, you know, their, their cost of electricity was, was about 30 cents uh, per kilowatt hour, which is really, really high. So, and that's yeah. really attributed to the, the, the high cost of bringing in the fuel uh, to the facility. So now, you know, by installing a, a battery energy storage system and pairing it 
with the solar and the PV, you're really able to reduce your fuel consumption. You're creating less CO2. And on average, this site, by pairing the, the batteries, the solar, and the diesel, we're able to save about 500,000 euros uh, annually. Wow, that's, that's significant. And that looks like a very awesome situation. And these, these systems look very appealing. And is there anything that's keeping us or any barriers that we have from really letting these types of systems become more prevalent in day-to-day -day activity? I mean, what's, what barriers do we have to overcome? So, you know, anytime you're coming up with a new technology, you always have to, you have to educate both the end user and the, the people that are putting in place the rules and regulations. So we really have to work with the different grid operators uh, to make sure that we are are operating within the parameters that they have set aside. And, you know, one of the things that we're really working through is ha working with those utilities to allow, whether it's end users or people that operate and own these battery energy storage devices midstream, to stack the value uh, to increase uh, the ability to get the return on investment needed to continue to install these these projects. Well, earlier you were talking about how California, one, they kind of lead the market in a lot of things, but they also have some of these systems already installed. Is there anything that we can learn from other areas within the United States or uh, what have you that could actually help us in this? Absolutely. Like you said, California definitely leading the way. You know, the California Public Utility uh, Commission has instituted a rule that they want to have 1,300 megawatts of energy storage across transmission, distribution, and customer levels by 2020. Um, and then also, they've, you know, they put their, their, uh, their money where their mouth is as well. They have, they've introduced the California Self-Generation Incentive Program, which allots um, financial incentives for the installation and operation of these uh, systems. And is California the only one, or are we seeing this in other regions as well? You know, really, you're seeing them uh, across the country you know, from Oregon and, and New York and Massachusetts uh, to Maryland and Nevada, they all have different targets or incentive programs to, to help the implementation of these projects. And then at the federal level, there's the investment tax credit that, you know, energy storage systems can apply for if they're powered by renewable energy. Wow. This, it, it really sounds like there's a lot going on here. And Tom, you, you know that I'm, I'm kind of simple and I need to have things you know, really down to like one, two, three, maybe four things that I can remember. Can you kind of run through the key insights or key takeaways for me to help me actually remember this stuff? You know, it's almost like you're setting me up here, Brian. Um, so some of the insights and takeaways that we're, like, we're, like, we're looking at is, you know, the increase in renewable generation capacity that is being installed and operated on the grid is we're going to require more and more dispatchable uh, or distributed generation resources. Uh, the greatest value that we see going forward on battery energy storage systems comes from stacking those various values. And then the most services and the most value can be obtained uh, the closer we get those installations uh, to the end user. And then this really ties into the next presentation, you know, intelligent controls long-term is the best way to optimize battery energy storage systems with the available energy uh, resources. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And for those that were joining in, watching us, uh, we talked about a lot of different topics, and please don't just take our word for it. Here's some reference material for you from Rocky Mountain Institute, the International Resource Energy Agency, um, various other resources available for you as well. And then uh, here's our, what we like to term our alphabet soup. We talked about a lot of different terms, uh, like your state of charge, your C rating. And if you're like me, you often forget what some of these terms mean because they change from every market that we talk about. So here's another reference slide for you to understand some of the stuff we talked about. Uh, and then again, we have some uh, more reference links to some of the items that were referenced within the presentation. Uh, Tom, you talked a little bit about this upcoming webinar. What, what are we looking at here? So the next, the next webinar is going to be really how do we tie, so we talked about microgrids in general, 
in 101. Uh, today we talked about how battery energy storage systems kind of integrate with renewable and traditional energy storage systems or energy systems. And then 301 is how do we tie all those multiple power systems together using intelligent controls? I'm really looking forward to that one. Yeah, that one is we'll really going to be, you know, how, how do we tie everything together? That one's really exciting. And we'll, we'll hand it back to our host. Thank you, Tom and Brian, for that most excellent presentation. And now our presenters will answer questions from the audience. Type your questions for the presenters in the Ask a Question box on your screen. We'll get to as many questions as time allows. Questions that we do not get to today will be posted online at www.csemag.com with the archived version of the webcast. And remember to download a certificate of completion or a copy of the presentation. Use the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen. So we've got a ton of questions coming in today. Let's, uh, let's get to these questions, guys. What's the best temperature for batteries? And I'm assuming that we're talking um, uh, the, you know, the yep, this, and this is Tom. So the, the, you know, the best temperature for batteries, you know, when we look at the battery energy storage systems that MTU is designing and applying is really, you know, it's really mandated by the HVAC system. You know, we've looked at applications in the, you know, the Northwest Territory of Canada where the ambient temperature is minus 40 degrees C. And we're looking at projects in the high desert, you know, at, at plus 50 degrees C. You know, we have to, you know, we have to always know where the project is going and how to handle it, uh, but it's really dependent upon the HVAC system and the proper design uh, of that. Okay, thanks. So the next question, moving along here, for a large hospital with a significant electrical load, uh, can a battery storage system replace a generator? This is Brian Ponstein. Uh, when, when designing for mission critical applications, and we have to, especially in North America, we have to think about the codes and the standards that we have to comply with. So when you say a large electrical demand, it's going to depend exactly what we're talking about, and that would be something that we'd have to look into fine details. But some of the key things that we have to make sure, ensure is that we have enough capacity and we have enough uh, megawatt hours um, to last the duration that is needed for both the client and the code required for that application. So it's something that we're going to have to dive into, look at a case-by-case -case basis, but it could be a, a possibility. Um, don't think that it's not a possibility. It's definitely a possibility. It's, again, and one of those things that Tom and I talked about that it's another piece in the toolbox that we can use to offer a client a different solution than maybe they experienced in the past. Next question, wind and solar, like you uh, talked about in the presentation, wind and solar do make sense, uh, but it's not always windy or sunny. Uh, what are some of the things that limit the capacity factor for natural gas and coal? Oh, the this is Tom, you know, the, you know, the limiting factor for, for natural gas and coal is really you know, like we talked about in that slide earlier on, it's the time that that particular power plant is at maximum capacity. You know, it could be the, the cost of the fuel. You know, those large-scale energy resources now are really dispatched on, on, a, on a contractual basis. And if, the, if they can't win a contract based on their cost to create fuel, then they're not going to be on. And that will kind of be the limiting factor for the capacity factor. Next question, what is the power output of the MTU unit you showed on slide number 17? The, uh, the, the, it is rated at 2,000 kW and one megawatt hour. So it has a two megawatts at a 2C rating. All right. Um, with, I'm sorry, with Emily, uh, with other ratings and sizes uh, available. 
Okay, good answer. Okay, next question. How do you size the battery based on ramp rate? Oh, the battery is really, you know, we really size the battery based on the application. So how quickly we have to discharge the battery and how often we have to recharge it, the cycle time is really the key uh, to the sizing. That makes sense. Okay, the next question. How does the cost of batteries compare to the cost of generation? Oh, there, you know, the cost per kilowatt of a battery energy storage system is a little bit uh, more expensive, but, you know, you have to take into consideration the life cycle costs. Um, so we really, you know, as an energy solutions provider like MTU, we really look at the system as a whole, and we try not to focus just on the, the upfront cost. It's, it's really an energy solution that you're going to have to live with for maybe 10, 15, 20 years. So we really look at it as a, as a life cycle cost uh, item. Okay, where, where do you install this equipment? Do you have an example of indoor installation? And uh, does it impact, uh, is there an impact to building systems and costs associated with ventilation and things like that? Oh, you know, I mean, you're, this is Tom again, you know, you're always looking at when you, you can, you know, it's just as easy to put the batteries inside of a brick and mortar building um, as it is into a 40 foot uh, ISO container. Uh, but just to hit the nail on the head, it really comes down to managing the airflow um, and the environment uh, across the battery energy uh, storage system. Okay. Another barrier to adoption is battery maintenance and replacement. These costs can be negative, can negatively affect life cycle cost of effectiveness. Can you talk uh, about how this barrier uh, has been approached? Um, absolutely. So what we look at is we we offer a performance guarantee uh, for the application as we uh, match a battery to a customer, um, and the the life cycle cost of that battery is matched up to the application. And currently. You know, we're seeing, you know, life cycle cost analysis of the battery, you know, anywhere from 8 to, to 12 years, depending upon the application. And at that point in time, we would then, you know, recycle uh, the batteries, whether as a manufacturer or a partner with a, with a third party, uh, to reuse them. Uh, but we look at, you know, we definitely include the life cycle cost and the reuse and, and um replacement of those batteries as part of a life cycle analysis of any project. It okay, looks like we have time for one one more question. And uh, what is the lifetime of the MTU bat um of your batteries? Uh well, like we battery, you know, it, like, with, with the, like we okay. Well go ahead, I'm sorry. I think there's another part with battery technology constantly under review uh, will MTU enhance the battery types? Oh, that's, you know, we're always, you know, you know, we're looking to always improve and, and be better. You know, currently, like we talked about in the previous question, you know, the battery life is really dependent upon the application, um, and we would put the performance guarantee based on that application. You know, and that's at this, you know, it's at this version of our of our technology is where we're at, and as that technology improves, you know, we will continue. Uh, to incorporate it into the design. And like Brian had mentioned a couple times during our presentation, you know, the key for us is really, you know, being able to provide a, an entire energy solution uh, for a customer, the, the diesel standby, the natural gas cogeneration, uh, the battery energy storage systems, and then all tied together with that intelligent control system like we're going to talk about uh, in the final presentation at, towards the end of the year. So, Jack, you set us up perfectly for that uh, for that last question and the transition to our next uh, webinar. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that that was and, my plan. <laughs> and and just, just to add to that, this is Brian. Uh, MTU is constantly uh, developing and looking at new sources uh, of energy creation or uh, what have you. It's it's one of our core things uh, that MTU Onsite Energy is constantly in the process of doing. Um, we wish we could talk more specifically about what is happening, 
uh, but I think we all know why we can't do that. Uh, so there's there's lots of things coming on the horizon that we'd love to talk about, but those will have to wait till a later date. All right. Thanks for the great questions, and thanks for the excellent answers. And thanks again to our great speakers, Tom Drake and Brian Ponstein, for sharing their time and expertise. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to our sponsor, MTU Onsite Energy, for sponsoring today's event. Now that we're just about done, we want to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcasts. Finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media, I'd like to thank you for attending. This concludes our webcast. Thank you and goodbye.